then sort of look at adjuvant therapy. So this is therapy after the patient has had the surgery. Once again, we are talking about chemotherapy alone or chemotherapy combined with radiation. So first of all, if you look at what is the importance of adjuvant therapy and the timing of initiation of adjuvant therapy, one can see here that as time goes on, the patients are at increase of developing a distant metastasis, very similar to what we talked about previously. Now, if you ask the question, if there's a delay in the initiation of adjuvant therapy, whatever that therapy is, does that impact the outcome or the survival of these patients, as well as does it impact the ability of the cancer to develop distant metastases? So here in the top graph, we're looking at the ability of the tumors to develop distant metastases, whereas here we're looking at the survival of patients. And so if the patients receive no treatment, either seen here in black, you can see the survival is very poor versus, and then here you can see that the development of metastatic tumor is increased. So it's clear that patients do benefit from adjuvant therapy. Now you can ask the question, well, how does delaying the therapy impact these outcomes? So the patients in red had no treatment delay. You can see that they're the patients that had the least amount of tumor cells in their system, and those are the patients that had the best survival. If you then look at two-week intervals of delay, so two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, you can see that the patients who had the longer eight-week delay in their therapy, they had the worst tumor volume. Those patients also had the worst survival. So it is important that the patients receive adjuvant therapy, and it's also important that they receive it in a timely manner. So what are the therapeutic options for patients in the adjuvant setting? So there's been much debate over the course of time as to what is the appropriate therapy. These studies over here on the left would suggest that chemotherapy plus radiation is the appropriate therapy. These studies here on the right would suggest that chemotherapy alone is the appropriate adjuvant therapy. Let's look at this in a little bit more detail. So the GI tumor study group did study in 1985, and they looked at 5-FU chemotherapy with radiation followed by 5-FU alone versus patients who just received no therapy or observation. And you can see that these patients who received the adjuvant therapy with chemotherapy and radiation, their median survival was 21 months versus 10 months for those patients who were just observed, suggesting then that chemoradiation is important for this patient population. This was actually performed in Europe in the ERTC study, and they looked at 5-FU-based chemoradiation versus observation. And there was a trend towards an improvement in survival with the addition of chemoradiation 17 months versus 12 months. The SPAC trial was done in Europe. It looked at patients who received chemotherapy or chemotherapy plus radiation versus those patients who did not receive chemotherapy or did not receive chemotherapy plus radiation. And what you can see is the outcome for these patients, it was improved for those patients who received chemotherapy, whereas the patients who received chemoradiation, their outcome was significantly worse and almost equivalent to those patients who did not receive any therapy whatsoever. This then had additional patients added to the study and then reanalyzed subsequently. And what it showed was that patients who received chemotherapy had the best outcome, still approximately 20 months. However, the outcome for patients who received chemotherapy plus radiation was the same as those patients who received no therapy, suggesting that the addition of radiation therapy actually hinders the outcome of these patients. Now, this has been a very controversial study and, and it has to do with how the radiation was administered, and this is a multi-center study and sort of uniformity in the administration of radiation and how that impacted the outcome of these patients. The last, the Conoco and SPAC-3 study are asking questions about chemotherapy alone in the adjuvant setting. So Conoco-1 asks the question, is gemcitabine better than no therapy? And you can see that the patients who received gemcitabine had an improved overall survival of 22 months versus 20 months. The more impressive thing about this study is that the time that the patients were without recurrent disease was significantly longer in the patients who received gemcitabine versus those who received observation. The SPAC-3 study asked the question, 
which chemotherapy is better, gemcitabine or 5-FU after you've had your surgery? The answer to that question is that there's really no difference. So the survival associated with gemcitabine was 23.6 months versus 23 months for those patients who received 5-FU. The RTOG 9704 study, it asked a very similar question as the SPAC-3 study. Only difference is now we're adding chemoradiation into the mix. And so patients received initial gemcitabine therapy followed by chemoradiation with 5-FU and then followed by maintenance gemcitabine versus patients receiving initial 5-FU, chemoradiation, and then maintenance 5-FU. And there was a trend towards gemcitabine therapy being a little bit more effective in this setting. So what can we conclude from these studies? So we know that chemoradiation is better than surgery alone, and that's what we saw with the GI tumor study group study. In the SPAC-1, we saw that 5-FU is better than chemoradiation. Gemcitabine is better than surgery alone, as was seen in the Conoco-1 study. Gemcitabine plus 5-FU radiation is slightly better than 5-FU plus 5-FU radiation. And at the end of the day, the chemotherapy agents themselves are relatively equivalent. So really, my sort of summation of all this is that getting adjuvant therapy is the important thing. And whether your patient gets chemotherapy plus radiation versus chemotherapy, there's some debate as to the importance of that. A lot of times we will think about using chemoradiation in patients who have margin-positive disease, so those patients are at higher risk of developing local recurrence, and then add chemotherapy in the maintenance setting. And at the end of the day, we have to find better therapies for these patients. Why has there been little progress in the development of adjuvant therapy for this disease? Part of it has to do with patient selection issues, so inadequate use of imaging to define resectability. So I said to you earlier that it is very important that we define patients who have resectable disease versus not. Unfortunately, in a relatively common situation is that a patient goes in to have the surgery, the Whipple procedure or pancreatic duodenectomy, and at the time of surgery, when they open the patient up to start begin the procedure, they'll find evidence of distant metastases that they didn't see by our current imaging modality. So this is a huge problem that we have to work to improve. Margin positive resections are quite frequent, and this is why it is important for patients with pancreas cancer, particularly those who are in the position to potentially have it resected, be treated at a pancreas cancer center where there's a large volume of patients. They have a lot of experience of the surgical techniques that are required to obtain margin-free resections. Patients commonly do not receive restaging after they've had their adjuvant therapy. So at our center, our practice is that once a patient has had their surgery, they've healed from their surgery, they come to see the medical oncologist to determine what's the appropriate adjuvant therapy, we always get a restaging CT scan at that point. It is not uncommon for patients to develop local recurrence or even distant metastases in the time, the six to eight weeks it's taken for them to recover from their pancreas surgery. So it's imperative that patients have restaging imaging done after the surgery because we then base our therapies for the patient on the outcome of that restaging scan. And once again, patients should ideally be referred to high-volume pancreas cancer centers who have a large experience of dealing with these patients in terms of making decisions about their care, but also in terms of the supportive care that these patients require as they go through the therapy for their pancreas cancer. The other component of this is that we really have an adequate therapy for this disease. We talked just a minute ago about the different therapies that we have available currently, so 5-FU and gemcitabine is the best that we have, and this is in curing patients, generally speaking. Right now, there's not a clear role of maintenance therapy. We don't entirely understand if this is beneficial or not in this patient population. And unfortunately, we don't have the capacity currently to predict which patients will respond to our therapy. Now, in some other cancers, we're getting closer to doing that and understanding what are the molecular underpinnings that drive a certain cancer. In the case of pancreas cancer, we're not quite there yet, but things are moving in that direction. And just as important is the patients who are being treated, we don't understand the mechanisms of relapse or the mechanisms of, of developing resistance to our therapies. And so this will be an important factor 
as we move forward in developing therapies for my patients with pancreas cancer. So in our center, if a patient comes with localized pancreas cancer, which is clearly receptible, that patient has two options, to go to surgery or to have a new adjuvant chemo rads. Generally, if the patient is clearly a surgical candidate and there really is no other concerning factors, then those patients will generally go to surgery and then be treated with adjuvant therapy. If there's any concern about the receptability of the patient, so maybe there's a vessel involvement, those patients will receive neoadjuvant therapy and then be restaged and looked for receptability. Patients with borderline receptible disease, which is sort of a spectrum of what I just talked about, those patients will receive neoadjuvant therapy. Patients with locally advanced disease will receive therapy initially, and then we're going to ask the question, how we convert the patient to receptible disease with our therapies. If not, then the patient will go on to receive chemotherapy. If we have converted them to receptible disease, the patient will undergo surgery and then may or may not receive adjuvant therapy depending on what the initial neoadjuvant therapy was. Thanks for listening. If you like and learn from our Grace Casts, you can subscribe on iTunes by just searching for the term Cancer Grace find podcasts in the subject you want, pick a format of audio or video, and then just click subscribe. It's that easy. And for those of you who don't want to miss any of our programs, there's even a feed for all subjects. You can also find us on YouTube at Grace for Cancer Info, and that's the number four in one word, Grace for Cancer Info. Finally, if you haven't been there yet, please check out our Grace website at www.cancergrace.org. And don't forget that donate button in the upper right. Our content, which helps tens of thousands of cancer patients around the world every month, is made possible by your support.